Kentucky, and we will have a virtual event, which will be an artist talk uh, with Angel, who's also one of our artists uh, we're featuring in this exhibition. But now we're going to focus on our um, our task for tonight, which is to have uh, our two artists uh, speak about the history and also their their work to give artists talks about um, how their work is impacted by uh, past Chicanx artists, but also really how they're taking this into the future. And so this has been a really extraordinary event. We had a, a great reception a few weeks ago where all of the artists came and we um, were able to celebrate the work and the exhibition. And so this these events that we're having throughout the sem semester is a continuation of that celebration. So our first artist, Luis Valderas, is a multimedia, multidisciplinary artist and educator based in San Antonio. The imagery in his artwork is based on Mesoamerican mythology, combined with science fiction, cosmology, and ancestral narratives. Valderas transforms ancient icons by revealing their connection between past, present, and future. His own visual language exists in the third space of reality, the frontera where anything is possible. Through mixed media work, Valderas presents an art experience that prompts spectators to imagine and participate an intermingled future. Please welcome Luis. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I'm Luis Valderas. Um, I appreciate you all being here tonight for uh, uh, this talk that we're going to have. Um, Yaret and I go back a long ways, and, and um, I'm super excited to be here sharing the, the spotlight with her, um, I mean, with Yaret. And um, I appreciate uh, um, everything you've done as well, Yaret. Um, well, so um, I'm originally from the Frontera, from South Texas, and so I grew up in McAllen. McAllen uh, is right uh, about five minutes away from the border. Um, and so um, I have a lot of um, imagery that is kind of uh, influenced and based on, uh, on that, but also grew up during the uh, space race. And one of the very first things that I remember seeing um, in, on TV was a black and white version of the, of the launch of the landing on the, on the moon. And so that just really impacted me. And um, then uh, um, after I, I um, began working, then I... Um, I started exploring. So this is this is a shot on the way down south um, to El Valle. Um, real quick, the presentation that I have made, um, if you scan that QR code, you can save it and uh, use it later, because I'm going to go through uh, the presentation quickly and just stop at some key things. OK. So this is the piece that's on, on location at um, um, at the gallery up top, and um, it is a portal. Um, it's been um, installed once before in um, at, in San Antonio, but it's meant to establish uh, the cardinal directions and and develop uh, an experience uh, with the community that comes in to uh, um, uh, sit and um, act within it. Um, what influenced me to begin in this uh, approach on uh, how I make things and what Chicano Futurism means to me and how I've been exploring it throughout the years um, is um, followed by an approach of um, indigenous uh, as information and knowledge uh, connected also with um, a union ideas of uh, self-awareness and consciousness. So uh, in here, I kind of uh, created a diagram of, uh, of how I look at things and how I address things in, in the uh, movement in, or in whatever I make, because I make a I make mnemonic objects. Mnemonic objects are um, objects that teach um, an, a knowledge through um, the reference and the image and symbol that they represent. Um, some of the books you might want to pick up on is um, Nine Seasons Beyond 2012 by Dr. Carlos Aceves. Um, you'll find the footnote on the, on the slides at the bottom. But I'm also a member of the Tanco Collective here in San Marcos, where I've been studying uh, indigenous uh, uh, information and, and practices. So. Uh, that's one of the things that's influenced my work. Now, going to the um, installation. Uh, what you see on the upper left-hand side is the diagram of how the entire installation and the portal is set up. It's laid out on the cardinal directions of the Earth. Um, the ancients would uh, create space, great place, by setting up the cardinal directions on, at a location. And we start with uh, the directions north, south, 
east, west, and then the center point would be the axis mundi. And that's the way they would also establish the milpas, which uh, is how they would plant the rows of corn uh, intermingled with the three sisters, um, squash and chile and beans. And this is a symbiotic relationship that these plants have, but uh, more so it represents the symbiotic relationship that a community has with itself. So in, in the um, in the circle that you see right there and um, represents the, the creation of a community based on the uh, milpa process where um, the portal activates is activated by people stepping in between the uh, the cardinal directions now in this portal that installation that i uh, presented the um, the figurines at the at the bottom these are all um, uh, malls they're, they're jaws of um, earth monster beasts but they're sticking their tongues out um, and their tongues are two-sided they have uh, a reflection, a mirror on one side, and they have textural patterns on the other end, and they're facing, they're coming up behind the bacabs. These bacab forms, these forms are all uh, bacabs that hold up the uh, cardinal directions of the universe. And in, uh, in uh, ancient times, uh, when uh, our uh, ancestors of Mesoamerica established the location and established temples, they were always established temples based according to the directions, the cardinal directions, and then also the cosmology, the stars um, in the um, constellation of Orion and several other constellations. So um, in this case, the, the, the mouth is open so that people can reflect and, and, and they can stand in a circle and uh, create a community. Um, and this is a term, this is kind of related to the indigenous practice of uh, establishing a, a circle and then talking on equal terms with each other and passing, passing around the, the talking stick or the talking stone or the object that uh, gives us each other our, our presence and our position to be able to speak and have a voice in the community. But more importantly, it's a representation of the respect that you get within a community and how a community can move forward and grow and support itself just like the Milpa, the Milpa and the Three Sisters, they have a symbiotic relationship that supports each other, helps each other grow. So um, that piece is activated for that same reason when people stand in between, because what happens is that they can look to the right and to the left, and they can see reflections of, them, of themselves and other people as well in two places at the same time. So what's happening is, it, is a, a visual distortion of reality that is a conceptual idea of, of uh, existing in that third space, Nepantla. So this is kind of what I just explained earlier. And um, in this case, um, the diagrams, are, they're, they're set up to, to be um, um, in the cardinal direction. So you'll notice up in the um, gallery that uh, it's slightly off from the direction and the directions are labeled. So. Um, most of the times we have an idea of which way is north. Some, some of us can carry a really good um, uh, feeling of, and presence of where that is, but sometimes when things are changed around, um, we have difficulty in uh, establishing and understanding our, our presence and our location. Another thing that influenced my piece is um, monument number nine, and that was just repatriated to Mexico. Um, and it's an ancient Olmec uh, monument. Uh, dated to 800 BCE, and uh, uh, it represents the uh, entrance to the underworld. Um, and as you can see, um, the four corners are set up to be part of the open mouth of the, of the entrance to the underworld. And um, in this case, that center is right at the middle. However, the community is standing around the outside of the circle to understand and, and take into to recognize the entrance, because one of the things that um, that happened on a previous installation was the tongues of of this um, of these malls were bent forward. So, um, if you're familiar with the concept of the infinity mirror, where you can uh, stand a mirror at just the right angle, and then you can see various directions, um, when the mirrors are facing forward, the focal point is down in the center. And um, after I went to describe the, the uh, way the portal works, um, there was a number of people that would sit and meditate in the center were having experiences of, uh, of uh, connecting to a different realm um, simply by meditating. And, and uh, um, so we begin with the identity and then lead back to, to the community circle in the installation. This is how I made these pieces. Um, I find that I, I, I use, I recycle materials and I, I mismatch. This is uh, 
raspachismo. Um, so I grew up in the in the in the barrio, and you you have to make do with what you got. But more importantly, I also grew up in a flower shop and and um, in a ceramic shop. So I learned to make do and connect things together. My pieces are made out of styrofoam and ceramic uh, heads and uh, wood structures. But uh, um, more importantly, uh, they are also made of just primarily electronic shipping components. Um, the packaging used in electronic shipping, um, uh, so there's something having to do with the engineering of, of how those pieces are protected. They give uh, very specific forms and patterns. And I was able to cut them up, deconstruct them, and rearrange them into figures. And um, so I felt like a foam monger instead of a fishmonger. Um, but uh, that um, kind of... Uh, flows into what I've been doing for a while, which is combining um, my different objects that I make to other uh, refuse material. For example, these are um, calaveras that I put into an installation for Dia de los Muertos because I also create those portals as well. And um, the calaveras are ceramic, but the big uh, styrofoam pieces uh, for the fruits, they're, they're styrofoam. And, and, you know, for example, the, the uh, strawberry is the very first fruit that, that comes in the spring. So it's, it's the fruit that gives us hope. Uh, watermelons are watermelons are real special. That's all I'm going to say right now. Okay, um, but um, I started working on watermelons for, uh, back in uh, in uh, what is it 2012, something like that. Or actually, you'll see 2004 was the very first incarnation of the watermelons. And these are temples. These are, these are portals uh, created during Dia de los Muertos because that's what they really are. The, if you're doing it right, you you have the the installation layered in the three steps at least, and then you have the four elements of the universe represented, earth, wind, fire, and water. And, and then um, you have all the other um, necessary items and objects in the uh, altar. Oh, this is where I grew up at. That's my, my mom's flower shop, ceramic shop. We used to make Dia de los Muertos uh, uh, wreaths and things for that. Um, so those are all cultural practices that I learned to keep alive. That's my mom. And that's my dad. Um, my dad's off in this other journey already. So, uh, um, but my mom's still down south. But going back to futurism. So we um, we, we talked about uh, how futurism began in, in Italy uh, during the Italian um, uh, era. And we're, I was just talking to Peter and uh, looking at the idea that this was about 100 years ago when we were dealing with ideas of looking at things from a different perspective. The flyers that uh, were flying Italian uh, airplanes found this out and they discovered that and began pushing this forward. So that was the beginning. And so in my case, I just mix and match and use materials that, that I combined. And I've had to learn all this through the work at um, in the ceramic studio from when I was a little kid. But it definitely um, made me see the temporality of, of, of everything around us. We were, uh, unless you're a mountain or unless you're the ocean or unless you're the sky, everything else is temporal and uh, has its very specific time frame. So um, according to Catherine Ramirez, PhD, she was one of the very first ones to write about Chicano futurism. It addresses and retells stories of first contact, colonialism, um, displacement, labor migration, resistance, and social cultural transformation in the Americas. And so she's uh, one of the, um, she's the mother of futurism, of Chicano futurism. Uh, she was one of the first to write about it and collect it. Um, so with cultural rituals that I create, uh, it requires uh, um, their, uh, the making of objects that are imbued with that contextual knowledge. The objects that they, like I said, act as mnemonic tools through visual information received by the viewer to convey different information. So this is another a circle that uh, we created when uh, me and my partner and uh, created a large print and turned a football stadium into a temple. Um, this was site specific, time specific. So we made it on the uh, celebration of which uh, was a feast day. And um, so uh, the influence is uh, the temple at Teotihuacan. And uh, so what I do is recombine my objects. I'm, I feel I've done stage work before and, and set design. And so with that in mind, uh, I create objects that I can rearrange, replace, and continue with the contextual ideas that I'm representing. The skulls um, I cast about 20, 30 years ago. Um, and um, well, actually 2004. Um, and I've let them age. And so I'll cast about 50 of them, they age, and they've become part of my objects. But one of my biggest uh, con um, things that I've done is, is create this installation right in front of uh, the Alamo, uh, well, down the street from it. Uh, that's my dad. 
Um, and um, I come up with the, this idea one time we went to visit Bristol and, and um, if you ever read Connecticut, Jan Connecticut Yankee in, um, in uh, King Arthur's Court, um, came up with this idea of uh, uh, mariachi uh, visiting uh, uh, King Arthur's Court as well. And so um, why not have him uh, visit and time travel in San Antonio? And he's time traveling now that uh, they're redoing the Alma Plaza and um, he's overlooking the battlefield. So uh, I'm, I, I think that's one of my funnest installations. Um, but yes, going back to retelling the story of, of Mesoamerica and then rearranging our uh, these are two large prints that I make in uh, large steamroll events, and I uh, hand color um, the one on the right, and uh, uh, using uh, inks and uh, in the case of the skin, that's uh, powdered chocolate that I that I sprayed on with a um, rudimentary uh, uh, air gun, you know, just using a straw. And <laughs> um, one of the things you might want to read and look up on is uh, Jose Vasconcelos' uh, uh, idea of La Raza Cosmica. Um, I put a link on the, on the slideshow um, to UNAM's uh, copy of it. It's all in Spanish, so you might need to translate it. But um, tw about 100 years ago, the ideas of utopia and, and um, uh, uh, concepts of, uh, of the future were floating around and combinations of how people would come together uh, and form one cosmic race because there's going to be so much intermingling. We have no business with nationalism anymore and we haven't learned that yet. But um, we're 100 years later and maybe we can make a difference. Um, back in the 60s when the Chicano movement uh, started and um, there was uh, people that were exploring this idea. One of my mentors did the same thing and uh, Chista Cantu with La Raza Cosmica as well. Um, and in the meantime, Meanwhile, Afrofuturism was going long, uh, strong with uh, Sun Ra, and then we have Octavia Butler writing about uh, ideas of futurism, of feminism. And uh, so we go back to uh, how I play around with those things in different arrangements. So transforming simple icons into objects like that. And that, that tells the story of the frontera and the border and people lo losing their lives crossing the river and throwing it into the, uh, a little future realm with um, metallic uh, corn cob brackets and different incantations of it. And where am I at now? Well, uh, Chicano futurism is manifesting itself as a speculative hybridization of future realities that exist in the same time as the now in Pantla. Uh, so um, that's off of one of the recent uh, things that we did. Um, uh, we created a Chicano futurist uh, art movie and uh, this is the portal arrival team. Because uh, 20 years ago, I started Project Masa, and, uh, which is Chicanos in Outer Space. Um, I met the guys from Royal Chicano Air Force, and I got permission. You know, it was the idea. That, uh, oftentimes, as an artist, you feel um, like you're hesitant to jump into the void, into something different that's new. And when I was doing stuff that had to do with rockets in outer space and combining them with Chicano ideas, um, I wasn't very well accepted in the beginning. It, it was uh, back in 94 when I started doing this. And so, but I kept with it. And finally, after meeting those guys, uh, um, I decided to start uh, our own space uh, agency. And uh, this is the crazy timeline that um, that's happened since then. So uh, I think I'm out of time. Yeah. But um, thank you so much for listening to me. And uh, this has been certainly a growing experience for myself um, and a learning experience because I'm constantly learning from everything I do. And I'm constantly learning from everybody I run into and uh, falls into my orbit. Yared has been in my orbit for, oh my gosh, what, 15 years, mas? Uh-huh. And, and everybody that I work together with is, is like that. And uh, I really feel blessed that, that I'm here sharing this with you all uh, so that we can continue moving forward and adding to this. So please access the, uh, the uh, slideshow. There's references that you can read up on and use, and then uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Luis. And I, I do want to make a special note, really. The reason that we had this exhibition, the, this whole project is uh, stemming from conversations that Luis and I have had um, when we had a, another exhibition project a few years ago. So it's just a wonderful, I don't want to say it's full circle because it's the journey is only part way through, but this is another step along, along the way, uh, along the way of, of um, I think learning it's, it's about acceptance. It's about thinking 
it's about history. It's all of these things combined. So I really want to thank you for for bringing that all um, to us tonight, in the past, and hopefully in the future. So our next artist, um, Yareth, we're, before I introduce Yareth, we are going to have a world premiere of a video that uh, we just finished, uh, which was a, a time-lapse a video of the installation that's upstairs, this wonderful uh, mural project, 3D elements. Um, and as we get ready to show the video, I really want to uh, thank Jeremy Brown, who uh, works for the Dean's office here at in uh, the Division of Arts and Digital Media, who put a lot of effort into this uh, video to make it really wonderful. So the video itself is a time-lapse uh, video of the installation that happened uh, here in the galleries, um, really the month, August, September, one month. It was a really incredible um, uh, uh, production. And I wanna thank the team here at TAG. Uh, I wanna thank Bess, I wanna thank Ellen, and I wanna thank um, Bailey in particular for all of their efforts in making this happen and uh, working with YRF to, to have this spectacular uh, work. So we'll play the video and then uh, I'll come back after it's done.
So I just, you know, we really wanted to show that video to show how painstaking uh, this process was um, and how um, it's only here for this semester. So it's an ephemeral work. And um, so if you haven't seen it, those of you on Zoom, um, those of you that are here tonight, uh, we can go upstairs after, but please uh, spend some time and come back multiple times to view the work. Uh, and I just also want to just, I didn't say this before, but those of you on Zoom, we're going to have a question, we're going to have a Q&A after, um, in, in, uh, at the end of the, the event tonight. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat and uh, we'll have those answered. So if you have questions for Luis, um, start thinking of them now. Okay, now I'm going to introduce Yarath Fernandez. Yarath Fernandez is a mixed media artist and arts educator based in Austin. Their work experiments with artificial environments and futurist ways of interacting with nature through site-specific installation work that respond to various landscapes, including the Mexico-US border. They investigate different solutions for possible environmental extinctions often creating spaces that reflect non-linear time, invented organisms, systems of growing, and geometrical frameworks. Their vibrant and colorful installations provoke ways to rethink how we coexist with the natural world through art, science, and imagination. Please join me in welcoming your head. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Jared Fernandez. And uh, first of all, I feel very honored to be part of this uh, exhibition with Luis. As he mentioned, we've known each other for a while, but I think he has sort of like pulled me to his world. And uh, I'm, I always felt like my work doesn't really fit uh in other places so i think i found a place and also i'm very grateful for the team of the gallery because this type of work that i do now i can't do it unless i can have people that can support me so um i i really appreciate that this is one of my leaf designs um i will go back into it but um i'm gonna start with some of my older work and then work my way into the the piece that is upstairs and um, then kind of go back into some of the uh, previous previous pieces as well. And, uh, not sure, like which is that we're done. Not sure. I mean, this is what the next slide, but uh, I don't know if. Yeah, so this one is called uh, Tesoros Nacionales, uh, National Treasures. And this one was done at uh, Mexicarte Museum a couple of years ago. Um, and so all of my work focuses on um, nature around the border. I'm originally from the border and I, I grew up uh, in Mexico, in Matamoros, and so I grew up crossing the border uh, almost every week. And so I think that experience really has shaped me in why I talk about nature right now, because when I was uh, a kid growing up, like looking at the border wasn't really about nature. It was about, you know, uh, bridges, uh, lots of traffic. Uh, immigration issues, uh, drug issues, and that kind of stuff. So I really wanted to focus on kind of giving a different perspective of what the border is because um, there's a lot of beauty and there's a lot of um, uh, plants and organisms that only exist there. So we have a very unique ecosystems there. So um, this wasn't the first one that I did uh, about the border, but uh, it, this one is focusing on some places in the border where um, the construction of the newer wall was happening a couple of years ago. It's already real and present, but it was uh, there was a lot of disturbances on the uh, area's construction, which then um, affects the the plant. So there is a very um, nice uh, butterfly center in. I think it's, it's Mission, Texas. 
And so uh, this one is centered around that. And this particular installation has two other pieces adjacent. Uh, some of it, uh, one of it on the left is uh, bisons, and the other one is a cloud that shows uh, the the border, the the yeah. Okay. Is it supposed to be this one? It's supposed to be that one. And I supposed to. Yeah. Wait. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, this happens with bandwidth. They can click up there. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, next. Yeah. So um, I like to focus on um, organisms throughout the, the border. And so this is how I started. I kind of started to look just as the, at, the, at the border, uh, but it's like 1,500 miles of border, right? So there's a lot of organisms. And so the bisons, there's a, in some point in Arizona where there's a herd of bisons that cross. And so one of the things that the bisons did because uh, there was a border wall that was a mesh style. There's different styles of border walls, really. And so that one's a mesh style. And so it kept getting, getting put up. And so the bisons would just kind of like go through them and make holes for them, kind of just opening their own path. And so um, the beauty about that is that it will create some sort of path for other organisms to go through, you know? So, and so a lot of the, uh, my idea with this type of work is that really there is no border, right? So um, it's a construct and uh, I like to take a, na take a look at nature to get that point across. Okay. There. Um, so this one is one of my biggest installations. This one um, was done at the Mexican American Cultural Center here in Austin. This was done in 2019. Um, also in the last one I show you, I had someone help me. I had someone help me uh, be able to finish this installation. This one is 40 feet in length. And this is the map of the border. And so in one point, it's, that would be like Brownsville over there and then San Diego over here. Um, and if you think of the line of the world and start seeing it, uh, and then I also use a lot of very small elements that I like to add on the wall directly, uh, like you saw in the, in the video. And so in a way they start to, I start to deconstruct um, imagery in a way. So what you see in the center, there are mountains and that's done with uh, nails and thread. Um, and then the grasslands and the uh, plains are by uh, in the corner, right? So uh, those are just, I think I use lollipop sticks and those were directly on the wall. And so there's also like a lot of warp of perspectives that I do on my work. Cacti done with, um, pompons and um, yeah. And so there's always elements that I paint. And for this one, it was just a design. And as I, I was, I kept moving to, through my ideas on installation work, the, those designs became more specific, right? So uh, on this one, it was a sort of the construction of the border wall. So those are thinking of colors of the border, like thinking of oxidized metal. Um, this one is the shortest installation that I've done in an amount of time. It's called Jack Rabbit and Jack Rabbit Star. And I did this at uh, University of Illinois uh, in Urbana Champaign campus, which is about an hour away from Chicago. And so I had one week, and so this was done in about four days and a half and it was up for one day and that was it and uh it was a mini um presidency it was one week and so i just flew there and i had to be resourceful and so i just worked with black and white i had a can of white paint a can of black paint that had rolls of craft paper and so i just used that to my advantage because i could use as much as i could the little things that you see uh, floating, well, they're not floating, but they're attached. Uh, those are leaves that I picked up from uh, the ground. They're very um, dreamy. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen, if you've ever been north, they kind of look like they're 
uh, whirling down like little helicopters. Um, I used to live in Michigan, so I had seen those before, and so I painted those. Um, and so for this installation um, here, this was done last year, and uh, I was already thinking more specific of plants in uh, South Texas back at home, which is Rio Grande Valley. And so this, uh, well, this is actually a video of, it's a stop motion of the uh, installation. And so the plants are milkweed uh, prostrates, and so they only grow in Star County. And there was like a play of, of words that kept repeating with this installation because uh, they kind of look like star and then they are in Star County. And then I started working with a jackrabbit. Uh, the jackrabbit is a star also in my work. And um, let me see if I can play it again. Yeah. Um, and so he's supposed to sort of be uh, bringing kind of light to the endangered of the border. And so he's sort of like walking around, also like war perspectives, because the um, the plants look like they are like like this, but really you will look at them down, right? So it's a different perspective. And then looking up at the sky, we'll be looking at the stars, but the jackrabbit is like facing, right? And also personifying the a star. There is also a, a hair constellation, so all of it kind of play together to create the installation. Um, and so this is the most recent installation upstairs. Uh, and I never done an installation uh, with so much detail. And um, this is a landscape in South Texas. Uh, and the name also transboundary landscape comes from the idea of nature existing the same in both sides of the border, right? So again, the idea that a border is just a construct and that nature is a, a really good way to understand that um, is the same in any, any place. And for me, as someone that, again, grew up in the border, I never really realized that until like I was older. And there was a trip that I took a, a while back to Big Bend where you can actually cross into Mexico. And that was the first time that I saw nature without any barriers. And uh, it was like mind blowing to me to be able to see nature like that and that it, it could exist and it does exist. Um, so on this one, I focus on a landscape in South Texas in um, Star County. And so I was actually getting very interested in the plants there. So I took a trip in the summer and so I documented uh, plants and I was looking for endangered plants. And so I took a friend with me that could help me uh, find the plants. And so it was a very short trip, but I ended up finding a plant nursery. And the guy that was there was an ethnobotanist that was just all into endangered plants in this area. And so he was growing some in his nursery. And so I got to see some of those plants. I didn't even have to go too, too far. Um, but we also went out into uh, public land and tried to look for plants. And so that's where this piece comes from. And so the, the lines painted on the back are bar barretta trees. And those are only found in Star County. And then the ones in the bottom are golden bush, and the ones that are uh, in the center top are hibiscus, heartleaf hibiscus plants. Uh, and in Spanish, I think it's called tulipan del monte. And then um, the seed pods and the, the plant leaf design is, uh, comes from a yellow show, and that one is, it's not considered endangered, but it's a rare plant in also South Texas. And so what I'm trying to do is just kind of present nature in a different way. Also a landscape. It's really hard if anybody, you know, paint landscapes or you're familiar with landscapes, they can be very difficult to kind of separate different types of plants. And so I really wanted to focus on each one of them individually. So the ones at the bottom are the golden bush and they have yellow flowers. And that's where um, all of those uh, pins and pompons uh, uh, are used. Uh, so I like to use things that I can just represent plants. Things are very simple. Uh, I also make my own uh, pieces like the seed pods and uh, leaf designs. And so uh, overall, I see this type of process like drawing, just drawing in a very large piece of paper. 
uh, that I can keep. So um, yeah, uh, so uh, back to the trip, this is more or less how South Texas Star County looks like. And so there's tons of plants in that time. I think uh, it was only two to three days and we were able to identify like maybe uh, 15 plants or so. Uh, and it was a process of photographs and also uh, collecting plants. And so uh, these are some other uh, of plants that grow. And so plants also grow in community, right? And so some of them were photographed uh, and some of them are collected. The ones that I was able to collect are plants that are abundant, you know? And so uh, you, people cannot collect endangered species, it's illegal. Um, so these ones, we were collecting them and uh, we were, Focusing on the scientific name, but it's very difficult to remember those. But I can tell you, this is the golden bush, and that's the barreta tree uh, specimens. And so uh, I find a lot of inspiration in nature, but also science and um, plant collection. So uh, this is an original herbarium uh, specimen from University of Texas. And so this is the... Uh, the midweed uh, prostrate that comes from the jackrabbit uh, installation. And so um, they have a really large herbarium. And so if anybody is interested, you can find like thousands and thousands of specimens in this place. And so before the trip, we went uh, to the herbarium to see what kind of plants we could find first. And so uh, I think that was definitely also like an inspiration to really slow down and, and take a look at plants. Um, uh, to identify them, because I think uh, at some point we were able to do that as humans, but we're not able to do that anymore. So I think slowing down and taking a look at nature um, was something that I was trying to do with this this piece. This is where the seed pods and the leaf design comes from. This is the yellow show. And so again, this is a plant that was um, uh, it's considered rare, and so uh, the, how we found it is as I was going through the days in how to find plants, uh, it's almost like um, when you turn off the light and you're readjusting your eyes, uh, the same thing happens. Like your eyes are readjusting to for what you're trying to find, and so uh, all of a sudden, like everything is in a way green in this in this uh, case, and then things start to pop up because they're different. And so that's how I was able to uh, pick up on the plant and we found this one. And so uh, because we didn't know what it was, we couldn't pick it up, right? And so we just photographed it. And so um, so far there's been like a lot of questions from this the seed pods, but they are very large um, and compared, uh, in real life, so. So uh, original uh, leaf to create my own leaf designs. And so uh, at some point for in the installation, I wanted to use the plants to create my landscape, but also um, at some point start to create different type of imagery for my plants, right? So I started to create uh, my own image uh, based on the, the leaf of the yellow show. And so there's two versions there. And so the one on the bottom is the one that I ended up using for the installation. And so those pieces are made out of resin. So I made a, an original from clay and then made a, um, made a mold and then casted those out of resin. And then at some point uh, for me, like this, they start to be almost like organisms or creatures that start appearing in the work. So, uh, so here are the seed pods at the top. And this is a work that I did in 2016 and I just wanted to bring it back because uh, something about the installations that I do is that, um, they are temporary and they're site specific. Uh, they're here and I've always wondered like how I can show them again, how that would happen. I'm not very interested in recreating the piece again. I'm more interested in 
Uh, to me, I see it almost like an organism where if it appears again, it's like the same parts of it, but um, it's either a past of it or a future uh, version of it or a different, um, just a different uh, way to see it. And so this is the only installation and this one is object based where I have, I have shown this before. And so this one is called in production. And this is a little bit before I started working more uh, focus on uh, nature in the border. And this was done with Luis at Dirt Space actually. And it was the first time that I started to take more in consideration installation. And so the second time that I installed it was at the Mexican American Cultural Center here in Austin. And so uh, I called it in production second manifestation. So it was still the same piece, but it is not the same piece at the same time. So it grew, it had different parts. It had um, uh, more elements to it. The, the place was bigger. And so when I think of the installations, I think that um, they would grow or they would show a different stage of them, whether it's past or present or future. Um, yeah. And so I think that's all I have. Yeah, thank you so much. I'd like to invite, I'd like to invite both of our speakers to come up, back up to the front for some questions. So if you have questions out in the audience, uh, start thinking about those and uh, Nicole will come around and uh, you can ask your questions. Please wait for the microphone because you won't be able to, uh, our participants that are on Zoom will not be able to hear your question. Um, but you guys seem really far away all of a sudden. I'll come back over here. No, no, you're good, I'm, I'll move. <laughs> um, I'll start off, I have a, I have lots of notes that I took now. There's sprawling questions, but I want to ask you both to, in some ways, comment. Uh, one of the things that struck me just now, hearing both your talks, is thinking about research and the way that you research uh, your works. And it's obviously a long process. It's building for different works. But also one of the things that really strikes me about it is that you do research on um, a variety of topics or very specifically for specific works, but you bring your own aesthetics to them. And I feel like every, all of your, you know, you're at the, just going through, it's like, it's unmistakably your work, right? Once you, once you understand what you're doing, it's like, of course, that's, that's your work. And obviously you're, Luis, you're creating a visual dialogue and vocabulary. So could you just talk a little bit about that? Like, how do you, how do you take something that's from a different source and then you in some ways process it and you create it and it makes it something that is yours? Well, um, a lot of drawing, uh, uh, you, you draw, the, you draw too. And, and um, I think that's one, one of the things that uh, mark making is in our history uh, as a human beings. Um, beginning from the Lascaux caves and, and onward, which was a way of uh, making sure that we told our story to the future. That's why the cavemen in, in those uh, deep parts of the, of the caves left stories and, and marks. And so when I look at things, I, I try to draw as much as possible um, in any way, it, it can be a scribble, it can be a, a, a deconstruction of an object or a shape and then repeat the shapes. And then in my case, I, I'm very three-dimensional because I learned how to make things at an early age, working in the assembly line of the ceramic flower shop. So we had to not only be able to cut shapes out and arrange them, but we had to also process them and, and shape them and form them. So I'm, I made the transition from cutting out and drawing to three-dimensional forms like that. Yeah, I would say that um, uh, I do installation. Like that's my favorite way to, to work because I feel like I can break down information, like deconstruct it uh, from the original source. 
uh, but also I'm a mixed media artist, so I do drawings. I also do sculptural objects. And I think a lot of times I kind of just let the process guide whether that idea is going to turn into a drawing or an installation or or a sculpture. And I think that that kind of like broadens the, the process uh, in what it could be, you know, through the research. Questions from the audience? We have one. I have a question for Luis, because um, you mentioned uh, Napantla, and can you just talk about, you know, where that word comes from and what it means, like, in the Chicanac state? Gloria and Saldua, um, pick up her book, um, El Libro de Gloria, se llama, but anything that you read by, in Borderlands, anything you read by uh, Gloria, would be good, but that Nepantla is is a um, now a now a term um, symbol, uh, representing the third space of existence. Uh, it's the time between the sun rising uh, out of uh, the darkness into into the sky, and it's that pre dawn, and it's also the time before the sun sets, right after the sun sets, and is that pre uh, dusk. And that is the 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 place where creation occurs according to Mesoamerican texts and mythologies. Um, and that Nepantla was written extensively as a place where our gente can create and imagine themselves into the future, in, into a new reality that that can be hopeful and nourishing at the same time. So Gloria and Saldua, Borderlands. Other questions? We have a question up here. What made all this spirituality inspire you guys? Can you repeat the question? You guys make very spiritual creations, right? What made all of this inspire y'all? I think that's a really good question. Uh, for me, I think that is part of what it has been taken away from us and trying to find it again as a brown person in a creative way as an artist. And in, in my case, I've, I've been, I understand that uh, we are reflect, reflections of the universe and the universe is inside of us at the same time that it's outside of us. And, and I read a lot of quantum physics, uh, you know, not that I can understand the mathematics behind it, but the metaphors that I read when I'm understanding, when I'm listening to Degrassi talk about uh, quantum physics and how the most minute piece of matter uh, can arrange itself in a, in a, in a format that is re represented in ourselves reminds me that um, everything around us is bigger than us. And so that led me to explore uh, indigenous belief systems because um, I just was not finding what I needed to find in, in the Eurocentric belief systems. So understanding that as a cosmic citizen and participant in this existence, I'm responsible to myself because my actions affect my well-being. And then I'm responsible to you and you because my actions affect your well-being. And then I'm responsible to the community because my actions affect the community, uh, as well as being responsible to the earth because my actions affect uh, the well-being of the earth. Um, but more importantly, as, as a reflection of the universe, I think we're, we carry uh, the ability to balance things. And so I'm responsible to creating balance wherever I go. And... Uh, that is what uh, fuels my spirituality. I really just stumbled upon it by reading and researching and not being comfortable with what I was understanding from Eurocentric uh, um, ideas of spiritualism. So I want to kind of follow up with that and open a slightly different topic, but um, 
your work is very handmade, right? And both of you in very, in different ways. I know you use other, use technology maybe to get there, but you, when you're actually making the work itself, it's very handmade. Is that part of this connection that you're making? Do you feel that when you're, uh, is that purposeful? Um, I find making things by hand can also be very meditative. And so is that part of uh, the process? Is that, it's also a necessity for artists, right? We have to we have to do things with our hands. But I, just thinking about that, going off of that question about spirituality, and then thinking about these um, beautifully handmade works that you, both of you make. Well, um, I think whenever we make objects, um, we imbue them with our energies. Um, that's how come objects that are special get handed down um, to from one ancestor to a, an, a predecessor and so on. Um, when when I make stuff, I, I'm a printmaker as well. And um, understanding that I'm a printmaker, I know that nothing nothing is is really uh, can go as planned. You you have to be able to to be flexible and understand the process that printmaking takes in order to have an outcome. So. We go back to ideas of quantum physics when we pay attention to an object and it changes. Uh, that's the same thing that um, I think that we have an energy when we make things, when we make objects, uh, what we're thinking and what we're experiencing is being transferred into that object, whether we know it or not. And because of that, uh, these objects uh, can tell stories that um, we can use uh, to explain bigger things, uh, issues the, about environment, issues about social justice, issues about um, um, uh, women's body justice, uh, labor justice, uh, um, human justice for, for any matter, really. Um, so when we do these things, we have to be careful because our words have power um, and we can manifest what, what we say. And, and if we're careful, um, we can manifest good things by just simply speaking about them or making objects that represent those ideas. Um, you can see it very um, strongly in Yarez's work with her manifestation of, of the environment. Um, and everybody really who's been brought together for this exhibit um, creates pieces that manifest their energy and their spirit behind the objects that they make. So when we make, we need to, we have a responsibility. And sometimes we have Yeah, do you want to come in on the handmade quality of your works? Yeah, so I would say I guess there's a lot of repetition in my work on, on the process. Like, for example, on the the seed pots, uh, there's only about 20 of them on the wall, but uh, I didn't know how many I was going to need. So I casted 80 of them. And so it's the same process repeated over and over every few minutes, the same thing, you know. And so it's almost like a like a ritualistic approach to you know, that a way of working or like working on the wall and hammering like hundreds of tiny little nails and uh, one little pin at a time, you know, it's like uh, something about working with hands that is more about care. And I think that that reflects into the pieces. Um, so like you mentioned, like there's technology that we use, but you know, I've always been more interested in that idea of like working with with your hands and i think that it translates into the final product of the pieces great questions is there a question from zoom unfortunately no questions from zoom but i do have one question for your Earth. i know in one of your artist statements you talk about being inspired by border types and the reaction to border types uh, can you talk a little bit about that? And if you were inspired by the reactions or it was re reactionary for you to respond to such a call for border for border types at the border? Yeah. Yeah. So that was back in uh, 2018, more or less. And so it was when I was working on the uh, the yellow rumbles like a uh, piece for the Mexican American Cultural Center uh, here in Austin. And so that was the first time that I was being very, very specific where is my work 
you know, where am I going to base it off? And so I was reading a lot about the border wall and uh, what was happening. And one of the articles that I came across was when this was a time when uh, Trump was uh, the president and uh, he was very excited about the border wall and expanding that. And, you know, to be honest, the border wall has been built before that, even with Obama. Right. So uh, but he was very excited about the the border wall and he made a call for art almost. And so if you guys are creative people uh, and you're familiar for, with like uh, a an art call, he did that for border wall, for the border wall. And so there were people that were submitting um, border wall prototypes. And so there's a picture of him walking around, like checking out all of these border wall prototypes. And I just thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> and then other people reacted in the same way, creative people, and they started to submit this ridiculous responses to the border wall and, um, you know, things like just an open border with hammocks everywhere and things like that. And so um, that was a huge inspiration, like to start the work and imagining like, you know, like different border walls. Um, so it did drawings where there's a border wall with a bunch of holes so animals could cross through because my whole idea is about like the organisms uh, that are affected. So uh, creating um, border walls where animals can cross, which are full of holes and things like that. So uh, it's something that I think it's still in a, not as straightforward, but it continues to inspire the work because um, it kind of just allowed me to, again, like think about the border in, in a different way and also in a funny way, because thinking about borders and border walls can be like, very hard to hear especially someone in in from the border like me uh we've seen like the border wall go through you know the university of texas campus you know it really cuts through it and so you know i remember seeing it without it and then after so it's it it does something to you and so also as a way to kind of you know make a joke out of it that you know the border walls can be any type of design Hello. Can you guys hear me? Uh, I have a question for each of you. Uh, uh, for Luis, uh, I, I noticed the word portal coming up a lot in your presentation. And I was wondering if you were drawn to particular locations that you feel like may have um, like energy centers, I guess you would call them. Uh, are you drawn to those or have ever worked with that idea? And I, I'm, I'm fully, I'm aware of the of locations like they're mostly temple um, and I've explored Mesoamerican areas. Um, I, I'm still researching more and, and looking forward um, to finding other locations. But what I I have come up with is is um, a structure that uh, or a pattern of how um, a portal can be arranged. For example, cathedrals. Cathedrals are portals as well. There's very, and that's one thing that um, that uh, is present. And and so. Um, because of the arrangement of, of the uh, uh, of the architecture on the footprint of the form, uh, it creates the the structure that's lined with the the north south east west cardinal directions, and then the central portion where the the uh, event happens is right in the middle of the axis mundi. So um, I'm, I read it up on Joseph Campbell. I'm I'm a, I'm a student of Joseph Campbell, and and so this collective idea of of how humans are very similar in fact, similar thinking patterns and uh, is real uh, embedded in what I do. So uh, continuing to explore, yes. Thank you. And then for Yaris, um, um, I, a lot of your work is ephemeral and is that out of utility? I mean, is that just because, you know, you, you have a show and then you have to move on to another show or do you, are you really tied to the ephemeral qualities of your work? Like, do you prefer that it be ephemeral? One of the reasons why I wanted or went the route of installation is because I have moved a lot in my life and I wanted to do larger work and I couldn't find a way to do it unless it was ephemeral like that. And I had done small installations uh, before and I was familiar with the process already. So it was something between uh, being in, like truly being interested in the process of installation and uh, just that idea of existing in that moment. 
um, but also out of necessity uh, because where would I put a piece like that after I'm done, you know? And so it kind of uh, has allowed me to create more pieces like that to just kind of uh, work in the space and um, document them as, as best as possible. Hi, um, you both mentioned about being intentional and careful with um, creating your artwork and um, and having that translate uh, by the end of product for and um, for that care and that intention to be reflected off of it. I was just like curious to know, do you have like any traditions or rituals to get you into that like artist artistic zone before um, you create your art and your art and your artwork? Uh, I can't say that I have a specific process. Um, uh, I think that um, it's just kind of just music is one of them. Um, and I, I listen to music that doesn't have any lyrics. Um, and, and I think like that kind of puts me in some sort of almost in a trans uh, state, I would say. But I can't say that I have like a specific uh, ritual aside from music without lyrics very important um i um the process i follow is is constant um I'm, my my mind is always on I, even if i don't have time to make something uh, i've kind of uh, learned how to do that because i took the route of becoming an art teacher in order to get here as opposed to jumping into my mfa and then getting a position as a professor somewhere so that route took me through a different path that required me to be constantly on in my head and uh, making sure that I was absorbing as much as I could and making. And so there's always this, there's always some, some part of me working on making something in the back of my head as I'm handling different things. And so sometimes I'll go months without making anything and I'll sit down on a weekend and I have a whole body of work that develops in, in, in just one weekend because of that. But it's from a constant uh, process of, of following through the things that are experienced in life, the things we have to do, like go to work, uh, eat, cook breakfast, clean the house. In my case, I, I go outside and I'm, I'm like my mom. I work my, with my plants and I propagate, I cut, I trim, I, I pull, I replant. And, and then I pay attention to the time that takes plants to grow. And um, I listen to music um, um, and it depends, you know, what, what mood I'm in or what, what I need to feel like. Uh, sometimes it'll be Ozzy Osbourne, sometimes it'll be Led Zeppelin, sometimes it'll be uh, Los Panchos, or sometimes it'll be indigenous uh, uh, music. Um, so that's what I do. I wanna go back, I, I really love this year, both their connections with nature too, it is obviously, you know, part of the work and, and uh, kind of fueling a lot of your um, things that inspire you, things that I think you also both feel a responsibility to, um, nature being a, a, a part of that. I also want to think about um, uh, circling back a little bit to futurism, but I also want to do that through the idea of modernism, which I think is also both in your work, uh, maybe more in a sense of geometry, sense of um, symbolism in the way that you use uh, different materials. And so I kind of want, I know that's a kind of a, a little bit of a meandering question, but thinking about that, thinking about like how, um, again, going back a little bit to aesthetics, like you're, um, you're grounding your work in geometric principles, which are modern, but also ancient. And so does that help this time traveling aspect, you know, of your work where you're, you're in multiple places at once. Cause you're also in multiple times. You want to go first? Um, <laughs> uh, um, both of us work big. Uh, and uh, I think the, uh, my, my uh, mark making 
pieces uh, is uh, more of a ritual dance um, because of the size. Uh, and and I, I, I make marks with my body uh, movement as opposed to the small uh, movement in my hand, the, the bigger body movements that allow me to create the curves and the shapes are all based on how my body can move based on a pivot point or something. Um, and uh, I work on the ground. So it becomes a dance in a pattern around the shapes when I create the forms. Um, I do this when I carve as well because of the large scale carving. Um, but the geometry and the forms that I bring in are 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 something that's natural for me to make. That makes some sense because of the of the way I um, I manipulate the the shapes. Um, that's where I'm at. It, yeah, I would say I I had take a lot of inspiration from. Um, geometric designs and forms is more specifically platonic solids, uh, which are all about time and space. And so um, I would say maybe that keeps it more modern in a way. Um, I think at some point I, I defined uh, like chicken X for myself. And so I, for me, finally, I became, I understood that I was being a hybrid, and so that's being two, and I started to embrace that. And so I think there's a lot of duality uh, about, uh, you know, two. And so being from two cultures and a lot of things are like that. And so um, I think that maybe that ties it more to the past or like kind of going back and forward um, on, on the work. Well, it's also about perspective and taking a, a more holistic view of what we're making and how it connects to the, to everything as opposed to just being at the central point and running in line. Um, so when you decolonize time, what you're doing is you're going up and down on the axis X, Y, Z, and then all the way around so you can find different positions. Um, and that's where the relationship of Italian futurism um, is best expressed because of the advent of a different point of view that was taken that had not been seen before. And so uh, if we take this position and, and, and look at it that way, I think that's where we get the ideas and the conceptual uh, connections to other objects that we make or things. Yeah, because you're both, you're transforming spaces, right? There's a, there's a transformation process from um, ideas, concepts, materials into a whole new a whole new um, experience. Like you're, that place is never the same. Like that gallery wall will always be the gallery wall that that work was on. There'll be other things on there eventually, but it'll always, I feel like, have that memory also, uh, which is really amazing. And obviously, we'll always think of that back part of the gallery there as the portal too, because, you know, uh, it's really kind of amazing. So that is one of the reasons we really love to do those site-specific installations is because it transforms the space uh, very much. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I, I'm i thinking a lot about how, you, I guess, like how it seems like futurist or futurism movements are born out of a particular need from a place in time, from a particular group of people, and what is relevant and matters even specifically to you as the artist. And um, even in my own art practice, I'm thinking about like, I borrow a lot from Vietnamese folk tales and mythology to inform how I create certain things in my artworks. And I want to know how you, um, Luis, you mentioned like parallels between the Chicanx and Afrofuturism movements. And I and yeah, yeah, too, if you want to um, provide your input, but what parallels have you seen between different futurism movements that you find interesting or just different like similar stories or topic areas that occur like uh, across movements? Well, holding space in the future is in, in, in our future is what uh, seeing ourselves in, in a possibility, uh, um, seeing brown people, seeing, uh, uh, um, seeing ourselves there as opposed to um, the speculative ideas that um, uh, don't see brown people uh, there. So science fiction wise, um, that, you know, uh, Ben Hogan, the writer, uh, Chicano Futures writer, uh, uh, does this in his stories. Um, 
but um, what we're doing, for example, in, in uh, Afrofuturism was just that, imagining a, a better place for, for the future of African Americans and, and indigenous futurism is also doing the same thing, as well as Chicano futurism, Chicanx futurism, or Chicana futurism, Chicanane futurism. It, it, it all becomes uh, 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 labels that mean an idea that uh, has been fermenting for a while, and and it's the standing up of marginalized people, and and how we can see ourselves um, uh, making an impact that's positive in this place because we're just going to be here for a little bit. That's it, you know. And when you when you understand that temporality of the human body, uh, and then make the connection of the temporality of the human body to the temporality of everything else that exists around us, then you. You understand the responsibility you have for the others that come after you. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so very much for these great talks. Um, I think it's a, a way to explore the exhibition, explore your work. And so I really want to thank both of you uh, very much. Thank you. So before we break, uh, I want everyone to know that we have um, exhibition books that you're all welcome to take one everyone in the audience here um, on your way out they're really phenomenal uh, uh, books that are bilingual that we created for this exhibition so you're welcome to take one you're also welcome to go up uh, into the gallery for a few minutes we're going to reopen the gallery those of you that would want to uh, see the exhibition a little bit and I um, the artists will be up in the exhibition as well so if you have additional questions you can ask them for everyone on Zoom, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope to see you soon at one of our other events. Thank you both. Thank you.